Hello, everybody. Welcome to Profiling Evil by Mike King. I'm here with Chris McDonough, and we are looking forward to tonight's discussion on cults. Chris, how are you doing today? Mike, gobble, gobble. <laughs> <laughs> it is It is Thanksgiving week, isn't it? And man, we, uh, we hope everybody out there has a great holiday, that you have a place to go, that you are COVID-wise. Yes. It's a real thing, folks, and people are dying, and we need to make sure that we're uh, wearing our masks and we're protecting each other. Chris, I have a 91-year-old mother still left. Uh, that's the last one in our family, and uh, I'll tell you, we take this thing serious. It's yeah, no, it's and I saw you, you know, when in the back room with even Tyler. I mean, he he came pretty close to getting sick and from employees around him and. You were wearing your mask just around your, you know, around tie. Yeah, this is serious yeah, stuff. Yeah, it is. I'm glad your well, mom's okay though. How's your mom? Yeah, she's doing well. She's uh, <laughs> yeah, she's ninety one, and she, so um, I she's still living on her own. She's still driving, which is a you know at times I wonder if that is the best Absolutely. thing. But she drives short distances and and uh, hopefully stays on the back streets. So <clears throat> to everyone who uh, is here tonight, thank you so much for the support you've given us. Chris, thank you. I, uh, you know, um, I have the opportunity to go out and just bring other people in and do this. And I just love being with you and it's, it's great. And uh, I appreciate all that you do. It's, it's uh, awesome to do this alongside you. I wouldn't do it without you, buddy. And I'm glad I'm your Ed McMahon. I love you. And uh, no, we got, hey, we got a great show tonight. This is, uh, I mean, we're just grateful for everybody that shows up on our lives and subscribes to us. Who do we got in the house, Mike? And and then let's do yeah. it because this is right in your lane with your book and everything. This is fantastic to have uh, have this show tonight. This is going to be a lot of fun. <laughs> well, um, we, we've already got uh, more than 200 folks that have, that have dropped in. Uh, Miss Sophia, Great to see you, uh, Gulf Coast girl. Uh, thank you, Jojo Oil, High Priestess Illumination, MH, Maui girl, uh, <laughs> missing person, uh, four sons, mom. Uh, it just, it, the list Andy goes on and on. A Andy is here, um, Nicole Marie. Uh, we look forward to those who join up tonight. Folks, if you haven't subscribed to our channel, would you please do so? That's that's important in this YouTube world. So please uh, help us and and uh, subscribe. And uh, for those of you that can do it, consider joining the membership program. And above all, I hope you're buying swag, uh, the merchandise uh, tonight. I think we're going to offer a little special toward the end of the show for uh, for you on the on the merchandise side of the house. And uh, I don't know if there's a few more and, you want to call out, Chris, yeah, and then we'll get rolling. Guy. Absolutely, Mike. We've got ARS, uh, Maureen Walsh, Holly W. Thank you guys for being here. And Glowing Ember, uh, Allie Johnson, Spirits Heart. I just don't you just love some of these names? Yeah, they're awesome they're, names. They're just, you guys are fantastic. I'm a psychological examination on the names. I, I know. Yeah. High, High Priestess is going to really love this show tonight. <laughs> and yeah. uh, sh shout out to our mods. I mean, we can't do this without them. And the back room, all the guys and and everybody back there. So uh, Lisa Ward's here, Shauna Hall, Shannon, uh, Sharon T, Andrea Watkins, uh, Red Wine is here, Gulf Coast Girl, Knight Rider, uh, shout out from Mississippi. Uh, we're, we're just grateful you're all here. This is a lot of fun. And, and be safe over the holidays coming up, Turkey Days. Uh, enjoy it, like Mike said, with your family, you know, um, bring that love home. Uh, it's just good, but what do we got, buddy? Yeah, so Code thirty-three. Put, let's yeah, play. so so folks, I am uh, just so stinking excited about tonight, and I'm gonna I'm gonna start with um, with a uh, a slide here because we're gonna be talking about cults, and cults are a group or a movement, and you know um, sometimes we want to think that they are only uh, religious groups. Uh, no, I mean we're seeing. Uh, in the news cults that are not religious based uh this this is a big deal in our world and uh, cults are are something that we're all dealing with i want to um, bring in a couple of folks right now uh let's bring in ron and jackie van beacom hi 
And uh, everyone, please meet Ron and Jackie Van Beekham. Uh, we are uh, talking and asked the Van Beekhams to come and share uh, their story as we talk a little bit tonight about my new book, Deceived. Uh, and, uh, and I want to just say that uh, I, I have known Ron and Jackie for at least... 30? Four decades, <laughs> three decades. Yeah, yeah. And it is, uh, it's so awesome. But um, Ron, why don't you take a minute and just introduce the two of you and uh, let's, let's let everyone get to know you. But would you please let them also know uh, of your law enforcement background and the things that you've done in your life? And then Jackie, please do the same. Yeah, so um, I don't mind saying we're I'm 62 years old. I've been married to Jackie for 42 years. Uh, we met in 78. In 84, I became a law enforcement police officer and am currently still a police officer in a little smaller town than, than where I first started. That was in Ogden City with you, Mike. And um, since then, so 37 years and I'm still doing law enforcement and you can tell it makes me look like I'm now 90 years old instead of <laughs> 60 years old, but that's what law enforcement does. But yeah, 42 years we've been married and um, you know, the ups and downs and we started in with this um, thing with the Colts. I think we moved, uh, when, when did we move in? So four years later, so in 82, I believe it was. And then we were there for two years and I left, and then in 84, right after that, I joined law enforcement. So, Jackie. And okay, uh, and I know Mike from the print shop. I was a manager for him out in the North Ogden store, and just so happened he hooked up with my husband at OPD, and so it's just that's how we got into this. <laughs> you know, the, the funny thing, Chris, I, I don't know that I have ever even really said it, but um, when I was in high school, I worked in this little printing company uh, and there were um, two employees in there and one of them was part time. It was me. I was running a little offset press. And uh, when uh, I went to work in the police department, I thought I can't live on this salary, so I got to find another job. And so I went back and started working in the print shop. I eventually bought that. And uh, we were incredibly blessed. I was working graveyards at the police department. And, uh, and then I was uh, running this print shop in the daytime. And we grew to where we eventually had three different locations. And Jackie managed one of those locations and, and uh, eventually built her own, uh, which I think was just so exciting. <laughs> and uh, um, it, was, it was really great. And, but, but nonetheless, um, it's been wonderful. And we're so appreciative of you being here. And we, we've had a couple of people who have uh, sent some some hellos and some happy Thanksgiving. So thank you to those and uh, to those that have donated tonight, Lisa Marie. And I think I missed one. We appreciate that. So, so Ron, Jackie, let's talk about Colts for a minute because I didn't know that you had uh, actually lived in this cult for a short time in the neighborhood that became the cult. Folks were talking about the Zion Society. For those of you who have been paying attention a little bit, the new book that I have, Deceived, uh, is about this investigation. It was uh, a horrendous case. But we thought tonight would be interesting to talk about this uh, evolution of recruiting that goes on in a cult. And I, I couldn't think of anyone better than the two of you who were as close to the sun as I think a person could get and still not be burned. Yep. Uh, that's, that's probably the, be the truth. They, uh, you know, we, we moved into that neighborhood when we were 23 years old, we had, um, a three-year-old and a one-year-old at that time. And, um, you know, I didn't have a father that had passed away when I was 14 and my mom was kind of non-existent not non-existent, but she just didn't have a whole lot to do with our lives. Jackie's mom had passed away and her dad had remarried and moved away out of the cities as well. So we were kind of like, I don't know what, like nomads. And we were just, we bought this home next to Arvin's son. And over the course of time, because of our both religious experiences and beliefs, we became good friends. Then we were introduced with, with Arvin quickly after that. 
Well, you know, this is this is really interesting. And Chris, one of the first things that I wanted to touch on <clears throat> is this idea of um, the leader of a cult. And uh, if we if we could just uh, think about this for a minute, the leader of a cult is is a charismatic individual. They generally are the founder. But the thing that I found after investigating these kinds of cases for an awfully long time is that they're generally very narcissistic and uh, sometimes, and, and this this was something I learned from Dr. Lelich, um, is uh, Dr. Lelich says that in many cases they are psychopathic personalities as well. Um, so Jackie, tell us a little bit about Arvin and um, the individual you met. And I don't know how quickly you met him compared to his son who happened to be your uh, next door neighbor in this brand new house that this young couple has purchased. Well, his son invited us next door for a family home evening. And that was maybe about two months, wasn't mm -hmm. it? About two months after we had moved in. And so we thought, oh, this is great. These are gonna be good friends. They had a daughter, our second son's age, and we thought this was gonna be a fun place. So we went over there and it was just normal family home evening. I talked about food storage I mean, and it was great. And we came home and thought this is, it was uplifting actually. And so a couple of weeks later, the same thing happened again, but lo and behold, they had daddy there, uh, Arvin. So and, that's, and he started, you know, talking about the food storage and said how much that they had and, you know, started going in depth with that. So I'd say it was a couple months after we had moved in there that we were introduced to Arvin. But we 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 were introduced to Arvin, number one, mainly because we did buy a new home and, you know, it's all dirt. And Mike's and, my, and his son's yard was completely landscaped, beautiful, beautiful, completely landscaped. And so I had asked him one day, um, you know, who, who did your landscaping? And he says, well, my dad was a master landscaper and has landscaped many of the properties in Ogden. And if you want, he can come over and give you some ideas. And, and we said, okay, that'd be great. And then we started talking about food storage. We had a wheat grinder and I had made the comment. I still remember I made the comment. Yeah, you know, if the world lasts that long and it piqued his interest because that was their whole gist was that they were going to have these people coming from all over the nation or country, that they were going to come into his the community and that they were going to be able to supply them and be, I, I guess this is where his cult was all going to come towards. Didn't know it at the time. We just figured that they were going to be humanitarians and, and help all those that are in need. And that's how it first started. And that's how we got introduced to Arvin with the landscaping and then, of course, his religious background and and so forth. So kind of set the plate for our audience here where so they have a better understanding of exactly, you know, what family home evening uh, was and is at the time. You know, back what year was this? 1982? 82. 82. And mm -hmm. and the food storage kind of kind of level set that so everybody has a better understanding why that was so important back back then. So, so in, in the LDS faith, um, you, you know, you have church normally, and then Mondays is usually set aside for family home evening, where you have an hour set aside with your family, and you discuss topics of religion or play games or do whatever. And because their son and their family was the same, lived next door to us, they invited us over for family home evening. And normally we had discussions of topics of we at that time food storage because the church, the LDS church, had been telling all the saints forever to get a, a two year food supply. You never know when's going to happen. Try to get at least a year supply or whatever. And they'd always been talking about food supply. And so I had mentioned that, you know, I had, a, a, like I said, a, a regular wheat grinder, not electric one. And we had some wheat and we were preparing and trying to do the best that we could. And so we started talking about how we could do better with food storage. Could we do it as couples together? And then we went home and thought it was, man, this is so neat. This is a family that we, you know, we've prayed to live next to. And I can't believe it. What a great family they are. And then we went again and Arvin showed up. And, uh, you know, I had talked to Mike during, to his son during those times. And, 
he had said, well, I'd had questions asked to why Arvin wasn't in the LDS faith anymore. He'd been excommunicated. And so they brought over, over Arvin and he explained, um, like you said, charismatic. I mean, he was fantastic. He explained exactly how he was a member of the church, how he was still sending his children out on missions, um, but he no longer was because there was some discussions with with the church and he was actually away on business when the church decided to take action against him. He couldn't come and defend himself. So he eventually was excommunicated. And then he turns around and says, but that's okay because the Lord told me I can actually bring more people into the church being non LDS because then they, I can explain my reasons behind him and why I'm still a faithful member. And he went off on that tangent and we, we went home thinking, I don't, I don't makes just that makes perfect sense. So, yeah, this, Mike, this is great. Yeah, go ahead, Chris. No, Mike, I was going to say, you know, with your expertise and your background and, in, in, you know, for all these years studying these guys. And, and I know you did the AG's uh, research for the Utah attorney general. But but there's kind of this misnomer that this is kind of a religious thing. I mean, that seems to be a catalyst uh, into this type of stuff. I mean, I think we look at Lori Daybell. I mean, how we've been studying her now, what, for months and months and months. She's just whack a doodle. I mean, yeah. let's just, you know, let's just get to it. So, but that's where I was going. What, where, where does this go? Right. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, um, so this question I think is interesting, Jackie, maybe you could just answer. Did you know that the, the cult was in the neighborhood when you got there and would you have moved in if you did? You know, the funny thing is, no, we didn't know it was there. And after we had talked with each other, with with Arvin's son and daughter-in-law that were next door to us, found out I went to school with both of them. One, the, his wife was two years younger than myself, and he was a year older. You know, and I knew of them from the high school that I went to. So, no, and we had no clue that the cult was even there. If we would have known what was going to happen? No, we would not have bought that home. No. Yeah, so, yeah. so get this, Chris. I've known Ron. I mean, I, I rode around on graveyard shifts with this guy. Now, you got this young couple. They move into a neighborhood, and all of these people say, hey, we'll help you put in your yard. What are you going to say? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Like, how much? <laughs> oh, it's free? <laughs> so, Ron, no. just tell them what that was like, though, the day you came home and they had your yard done and what they said to you. Well, well, yeah, because, you know, he I don't even think it was a cult per se at that time because it was just uh, it was his son and his rest of his family lived with him uh, probably about half a mile away. There was only two homes and then we lived in next door. So now we've got three homes per se. But, yeah, we had talked about landscaping and, and Arvin had said, you know, I go out and do bids and every once in a while, if it's an overbid, I can bring something home for you. And, and I'm thinking, well, that's, that's just great. So I go work at the store that I'm working at and I come driving up and there's Arvin and his son in my yard. And I've got the whole front yard already sodded, leveled out and sodded. I have, I've got shrubs being put along the house. And I'm thinking to myself, holy crap, I've got already, the, I mean, my whole front yard done. And I lived on a side house. And within within easily two weeks, three weeks, my whole house was landscaped, full sod, a great big nice tree right in the corner, just beautiful landscaping. But it didn't end there. I mean, then came the railroad ties and they had to tear us off things and they had to do other things. And you know what? I'm 22 years old, poor. I mean, I've got, I've got a <laughs> wife and two kids and, and we're like, this is great. It's like, this, hey, this is money. Bring it on. You know, you know it's like, doing, but it was beautiful. We figured it wasn't costing us anything and it wasn't costing him anything because he said they were overbid projects. And so we're like, do we owe you anything? And he's like, no, you know, it's all been taken care of from the, from the projects we're on. I'm like, well, then what's the, what's the hurt? So, so, so we're thinking, well, we're living right because look at this blessings that are coming yes, our way. Sure, you know? sure. Yeah. Yeah, right. Well, and so, that's an interest, interesting piece, right, Mike? I mean, you because that was just coming off the seventies with Jim it. Jones. Yeah, that's with Jim Jones, right? 
Yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh is that the house? That's yeah. your house? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> I, I got to tell you, that's the best cult landscaping job I've ever seen. <laughs> I know, right? Let's just start right there. Well, it was, funny. It, it was really funny because Arvin, only thing Arvin said was, don't tell you, don't tell the neighbors how this is happening. So I had a couple of neighbors come over and say, you know, where are you getting your sod? And, and how are you doing this? And where are you getting it? And I just said, you know, I just made a little story that said, wow. you know what, we're getting it from Idaho because that's where the grass came from. And, you know, we, you know, we dwell in landscaping a little bit, but I wasn't supposed to say that Arvin was doing this all for us because I guess he just didn't want everyone wow. to know. So you got a bridge. They yeah. gave you a bridge. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's that's one one of the <laughs> homes in the neighborhood, but it kind of gives uh, everyone watching a feel for the dynamic nature and really the, the, uh, absolute polar opposites because you when you drove into the neighborhood it was so obvious which homes were cult members yes. and which homes were just the normal joe that you know half his lawns burnt and he's not got it edged and and this was a group of people that if a leaf fell on the ground on the off a tree they were picking it up and mm -hmm. and moving that thing uh, away and so um you you had this in, intense amount of effort that was put into the yards and and this this seemingly beautiful environment that had nothing but ugliness happening in the the background and i want to just pause long enough to tell everybody listening we're talking to ron and jackie van beacom who uh 37 years ago 36 years ago uh narrowly escaped becoming members of a very uh destructive cult that uh, ended up being the the uh, focus of, of my new book, Deceived. And they have been kind enough to come on and share with us some of their memories of what happened. I want to I want to talk about you've started this friendship now. And all of a sudden, one of the things that we see very characteristic of cults is that they now uh, go through a process of indoctrination. They have an actual program in place. Yeah where there are classes and literature and, and testimonials. Jackie, take us back and tell us how accurate this is when we look at cults in totality as it compared to the Zion Society. Well, that that's very accurate. I mean, uh, we had he had his daughter-in-law come over and talk to me one day and tell us how we were supposed to start um, – getting inspiration for ourselves, write it down, talking with people from the other side and things. And so they wanted us to do that for like, you know, half hour, an hour each day, you know, depending on what kind of, you know, time we had. And so naturally I thought, well, okay, let's just start doing this. So I'd write down and try, I thought, I'm not getting any inspiration. I don't know what you know, I'm doing. And so then she'd have Arvin come over and he'd say, well, you know what? you know, you need to be in tune a little bit more. And then he would just, uh, just little by little, it, it's just like lessons on what to do. And this is how you're going to do it. But it was his steps. That's where he started to sneak the indoctrination in there. Interesting. Fascinating. I mean, Mike, do you think here, this is going to be a crazy question. I'll ask maybe the whole group, but Mike, um, is this like a precursor for Chad? Is this, is, is, is Arvin and all of what we're listening to here, early '80s? I mean, because yeah. Chad, Chad, and Lori come along, and you know they're just you know in a different atmosphere. But is this like a? Do you think this could be a precursor? What? What's your? What do you think? You, you know, I think that's a, a really interesting question because what what I've seen in the course of my career, and of course, uh, by the '90s, I was doing cults and polygamy and other things full time. But um, as different as these groups like to think they are, they're very much the same in the in the in the organization of the group, uh, in the way in which they conduct. They, now they might use a different philosophy along the way, and they may have a different thought process. And uh, and probably a perfect segue to just talk about one other thing I wanted you two to talk about, and that is that. Uh, in reality, even, uh, you know, we have religious cults, we have cults that are non-religious. Um, uh, Nexium has an interesting string of cult behavior that is, is not necessarily focused on Christianity or any other faith system. 
um, but a, a lifestyle. And we're going to talk more about Nixium in the in the future. But religion has nothing to do with a cult in in my experience. Now it's used and it's used extensively, but it, it's really a tool to kind of prod people along and to motivate them and most importantly, to control them. And Ron, would you just take a minute and talk a little bit about how um, that process started to happen? And and we really didn't cover much on the indoctrination side, but about some of the training that you received along the way. So, so you, so, you know, we lived there for probably what, 18, 19 months. And in that first year, it was for us, it was all about our faith. And he gave us a hard copied loose leaf of, of living by the spirit. He had taken all these excerpts out of the prophets and leaders and everything. And maybe out of later on, we finding out it's out of context, but it was all by listening to the spirit and being guided by the spirit and then the food storage. And, and like I said, for, for us, it was every single day. And so when I'm 22, 23 years old and, and we're working as a group, but very, but financially, I'm contributing some, but very little. But we're going to the Bishop's storehouse. We're getting quantities of food storage. He had built a room downstairs in our in our house to store all the food storage um, for us and other people, um, and just continued to to tell us that we needed to live by the Spirit. Uh, he would say that he would give us examples in how he would go to Salt Lake. Had, had the spirit to do something, went and did it, and it actually worked out. And, you know, for a young couple, we're like, you know, if I could wake up in the morning and know exactly how I'm supposed to work that day, try not to cuss, try to live by the spirit, do the things that are right, maybe I'll get better inspiration as he was portraying to have. And little by little, every single day, he was bringing us into the fold, I would say, not knowing what his whole grand scheme was, but for us, he knew exactly how to take us. He he knew everything about us. We're young, we're we're not penniless, but we're we're struggling family. We don't have any other families per se. And so he puts his arms around us, gives us things that he know. I mean, like I said, if he's gonna give it to us, I'm gonna accept it at that point. And but we thought it was all in generosity and helping. And then I would give a little bit of money and he'd try fold it back. But all these, this is how he indoctrinated us by coming over all the time and then talking to us about the church and your elections and made college sure and your calling and elections made sure and how he was, you know, it got to the point after a year, now he's really starting to talk to us about how he talks to the Lord and, and gets direct inspiration and he's doing these things and we're thinking well, in any when I would have doubt, he would say, well, you don't understand. This is a celestial law that he he's able to perform, whereas we're just celestial beings. And if we were on a higher level, we would be able to get the same thing. And he would try to talk to us about it. And so, you know, being a young couple and not really religious growing up, because like I said, my dad passed away at an early age. And although I was LDS, I wasn't a wonderful faithful member so i'm starting to think well, you know maybe so maybe this is maybe this is the and everything that was happening to us we kept thinking that well, like jackie said this was we're living right we're doing the things that are faithful and we're being blessed and it was good things good things that, that we're point. being blessed by the by our heavenly father for doing for doing all this and he was this was a great thing that this man showed up in our lives and has a wonderful son and wonderful kids and you know it just seemed so you're on a spiritual quest. Oh, it's yeah. it's yeah. Uh, and and well, and I'd never be on a spiritual quest, but he tried. <laughs> <laughs> but at the but at the same time, they're giving you guys things like they're doing your 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 front landscape, and did yeah. they do your basement too? Yes, I, yeah. I heard they did. Your, why why they do your basement? What was that? They, they started off with an area for our food storage, and then they thought, well, we we'll might as well section this off. This will be for a bedroom for one of our sister programs that we had no clue what we it was had for. no clue at that point you what know, was going but on. That was, this is going to be interesting. Yeah. <laughs> so you know, next thing we know, our basement is pretty much finished with a storage unit and two bedrooms. And we're like, well, our kids sleep upstairs, but it'll be nice for them to sleep down. And 
it, it's just when I look back, I'm thinking, man. So, so Mike, what kind of what kind of person do they look for? I mean, here's a young couple, and all these blessings from heaven are coming. I mean, and you, you know, what do you do? Where, what do they look? What? Are, how are they trying to manipulate these guys? What's going on here? Uh, you know, it's it's interesting because in the case of the Van Beekums, they happened to be at the wrong place at the wrong time, yes. and they were a young couple who. Um, having a little help, not having per parents that, um, you know, uh, the support system behind them. It's it's like these uh, cult leaders and members uh, can uh, profile and find people that need a little something extra, a little piece of love or a little bit of uh, I'm your, your fatherly figure and uh, they can pull them in. Now, we used to really believe that young people were the primary focus of cults. That has changed dra dramatically, and cult studies in the last couple of years have really swung the pendulum and said that the cults aren't, number one, they're, they're uh, not interested in young people because they have support systems generally, parents who chase them down, somebody who's upset about things. Uh, younger people generally challenge thought process. So what they want are the more established adults. People in our age groups are our prime candidates for cult membership nowadays because they come with stability, finances, backing, property. Uh, when we think about Nexium, for instance, Nexium would, would have their members pledge something like their, their uh, deed on their house to, to keep them to be com, um, complacent and or complicit in, in following through. So we're seeing kind of a shift, but the other thing that they do is they look for people that want a little something extra. They wanna be a little more special than the next guy. So Jackie, maybe you could talk about this because one of these characteristics of cults is that they have this real elitist view of themselves and, and what they're teaching is this, uh, this unique cause and they're the only people who are authorized on the earth to be that blessed. And everybody else is a sinner. Um, how did that shake out with what you started to learn from this group as you uh, met with them? Well, you know what, Mike, that's exactly what they thought too. I mean, you know, they still wanted their membership in the church, which was kind of funny, but they didn't want to do the things they wanted to do what their celestial law was that they got. But, um, um, let me get going on this. Look, you're just fine. <laughs> <laughs> no wrong answer. <laughs> yeah, there's no <laughs> wrong answer. Uh, no, uh, about the doctrines and things, it was like, you know, okay, they would have the ladies come over and talk to me, like, this is what we need to do. We need to take care of our husbands. Um, we're not going to go to church anymore because that's just something for people who don't have this higher law that we're living, they need that. So we're going to have this by ourselves. Thought, okay, we don't have to get the kids ready for church, whatever. But all the time I'm sitting there, I wasn't feeling right about it, but we let the ladies come over. Um, a big thing, and anybody that knows me is I don't do dresses. I don't do dresses at all. That's a thing that they said would have to start getting dresses to wear around and things like that. And I thought, this is funny to me. But all the time, little by little, they're bringing in the different programs and the different revelations that they supposedly but, but those got. revelations and those the elitists that came from Arvin. That's where it was like the Godhead. And so even though those women had those suggestions, they couldn't do any of that without going to Arvin and asking for his blessing in that. And then he would be like, yes, go over and talk to them or do that. And so the women would work on Jackie and and Arvin would work on me, and um, then we wouldn't talk because we didn't we wouldn't realize so much what's going on. And I'm thinking, well, she's really falling Man. for this, and I'm and Jackie's thinking the same thing, and both of us are thinking in the back of our minds, something's just not right about this. And it was finally when when he introduced us with the big whammos of the sister program and stuff, we went to bed and we just said what have we got involved in and it was pretty rapid after that point that yes. we shied away. I mean, but it was, you could see how he just build up and build up and build up. And he was starting to bring other people 
into his fold, into his polygamy program. And once more people got coming in, older couples, Mike, we had an older couple, but then the more irrational thinking started to come from those people. And I thought this, this is obviously not right. And so it's, you're right. It's really, this is fascinating because the Mike, weren't these the grooming tactics he was using on the children that he's kind of modified to move it towards, you know, Ron and Jackie here. And, and I, one of the questions that came up uh, too, just to, so you can answer when this happened, you know, they, there was a question about how long ago this happened from Maui girl, but Mike, I mean, what, you know, what do you think? Yeah. So, so the, for, for that question, this was back 30 to now 36, 38 years ago uh, with the Van Beekums were there um, about six years before things really started heating up. And <clears throat> the interesting thing was in this particular cult, the grooming tactics for the adults was much different than the children. The children were purely victims of childhood. They did what they were instructed to do, how they were instructed to do it. Um, that we, we see this a lot in polygamy, and, and we actually generalized polygamy into what we called um, the conventional uh, ge ge geogra or not geographic, the, the conventional uh, long-term uh, polygamy group that was generational in nature, and then these convert groups of, of um, polygamists. The convert groups were much easier to break up because they were people coming in and they still had memories of what normalcy is. But in a generational group or in the case of these child victims, they were raised how to think and what was appropriate. They they really never had the the blessing or opportunity of knowing what normalcy is. And, and maybe in some part that's a, a blessing in disguise that they never had any culpability from day one, even through the adulthood when they had uh, spent, you know, 10 or 12 years being sexually assaulted. So, so Mike, they're there towards after a year. In fact, that's exactly what they were trying to tell us is that our children should be playing with their children, that it was carnal for them to engage with other individuals that didn't have that spirit amongst them and going out into the world and being carnal with somebody else you were losing the spirit. Um, we were told basically that, you know, your, your, your mother doesn't have anything to do with you much. Your Jackie's dad doesn't have much anything to do with you. Your other families, you don't really have much to do. You don't need to be involved with them. Stay away from them. We're your family. And so little by little, we kind of moved away from our immediate families and we didn't, we didn't associate with them, you know, because we were told that we were trying to live a higher law and we weren't carnal and the, you know, the whole outside world. And so we were being told and kind of being prodded to stay within this group. That was what he was beginning to build. And, and, and so, yeah, we could see it at a very beginning that they were starting to tell, you know, our two small children, Hey, just play with the kids that are in, that are coming in with, you know, with, with his son and his two children and stuff like that. And, going across the street and playing with maybe a couple of other kids. It's fun, but it's not the best thing. And they should probably be staying within the group. You know, it, it'd be interesting, Mike, to see an overlay uh, uh, with your experience in research and on Daybell, how in, in, you know, deceived, we have them utilizing the children, you know, through sexual deviant behavior, but with Lori and Chad, you know, and the children become a barrier to progression at some point where, you know, they've turned them into zombies kind of a concept. And, but in deceived, the children are tools of, you know, sexual deviant behavior. Uh, and I wonder, it would be interesting to find out what that crossover is in terms of the, the, you know, behavioral aspect of why did Ch let Chad and Lori go so far into, you know, the, the twilight zone, but these guys were kind of maybe on the path had you guys not intervened, you know, 30 something years ago. I mean, who knows, uh, you know, where this thing would have gone. Uh, what thoughts on, you know, you know where I'm going in this. Yeah, in this yeah no. It, and again, it goes back to that same idea that as different as these cults want to believe they are, 
they're very much the same. There has to be a structure. And the thing that's so intriguing about cults and cult leaders um, is the fact that uh, in a cult, everything is directed toward the leader. Uh, Arvin, in this Zion Society case uh, in Deceived, believed and purported and um, told people who followed him that he was the right hand of God, that prior to coming to earth, he had a sole job in heaven to teach all of us about this deviant behavior that he was trying to teach on the earth. And, and people were, were buying it. And it's one of the weird things about these kinds of cases, because then we look at mainstream religion, and, and I don't care what religion it is, when you see bona fide mainstream religions, the focus is outward. It's toward lifting the downtrodden. It's toward a God in heaven or, or Allah or, uh, or Buddha um, uh, and a belief system of, of Buddha and living well. But it's all about this uh, outward direction. In a cult, it's all about me. It's all about the cult leader. And in this cult, for instance, uh, just like in biblical times where they requested tithes from people to give a certain percentage of all their income, everyone in this group was required to give tithes to Arvin. The, the leader becomes, uh, this, this charismatic person becomes the focal point of everything. And I, I think this is an interesting thing that Dr. Lelich taught, uh, taught me, Chris, that I, I just, I guess, never really thought of. And that is that charisma is a, a social relationship. It's not some thing that we're born with. You know, we say, oh, that guy's charismatic. That's baloney. What they are, are manipulative, mm -hmm. narcissistic people that have learned how to manipulate a system that gives them this uh, weird imbalance of uh, of power. Um, J Jackie, I don't know. What are your thoughts on that as you think about Arvin? No, yeah, well, smooth. just like Ron had said earlier, Arvin is really, really smooth. And he will throw in, would throw in so many truths, and then he'd throw in that one little untruth and then keep throwing in truths. But just thinking about this too, Mike, um, when when other people start coming into the group, and this is when we are towards the end of, you know, trying to get out, what do we do here? Um, they would get their revelation for the group, but they would take it to Arvin. You could tell a difference between Arvin's revelation that he was getting and the revelation that the other people were getting. With Arvin, he was really smooth with it. With it, he knew how to present it. And it was almost, I mean, it felt real. These other people, you could tell that it was not of a good spirit at all. Right, Ron? Yeah, well, well, Arvin was exactly what you said. He was such a narcissist because everything that he talked about was about him, in a sense. I mean, he, he was so knowledgeable in the gospel that... I think he thought like Daybill, and that's my opinion. Like, I think he got to the point where so much studies didn't do him anymore. So he looked for more. And then he started thinking that he was better than anyone else, even in the scriptures wise. And then the deviance comes in and the adversary pops into it. However, however it works, now all of a sudden he thinks that he's just as important as God is because these is all the things that he has learned. And now he thinks, well, for me to be on that same plateau, I have to live a different type of law, a celestial law per se, because that's as he's tried to learn and dwell into that. And then he presents it to you. I never once, I saw him get stern, but I never saw him get angry with anyone. It was always in a low key, a smiling voice, a loving voice, stern at times. Um, so stupid that he got upset one time because somebody put the toilet paper under instead of over. And in his household, he demanded that it come up over because, and, and that was his, that was the sternness of him that had to run. Everything had to run so lined up perfect for him. And if you didn't do it, you kind of got chastised. And but it wasn't a bad you don't want to violate that toilet seat. You don't, you don't, you don't, want, you don't want to violate that toilet seat rule. Trust <laughs> well, me. When you got I, my wife, my wife would have have us all on that one. <laughs> yeah. However, let's talk about this wacky sister council. Yeah. Well, what's the what's the deal on that? Yeah. And, uh, 
Yeah, there it is. The question. Thanks, Pleasant Green. What's this? What? Is, what's yeah, this? Maybe, maybe I could take that. Um, yeah, please. Having having uh, <laughs> studied it for many years, and then Ron, if you and Jackie could talk about this escalation in the training that you received and what finally was kind of like the straw breaking the camel's back. And and so, folks, the sister council was uh, and and uh, don't for a minute believe that Arvind Shreve. Uh, was someone who believed he was a prophet of God. He, he was a, a miserable, wretched predator who chose religion to be the power guys to get what he really wanted, which was his sexual perversion satisfied. And the way we know that and the way that we broke him down in the interview was that uh, long before we uh, interviewed him, we discovered uh, prostitutes that he had been frequenting, we discovered uh, problems with child sexual abuse. We uh, discovered problems with being abused himself. Um, there were um, things that led, and this religious system, in my opinion, is, is entirely built to satisfy his sexual perversions. There is nothing religious about this person. He is a narcissistic, sick human being that thankfully is no longer living in this on, on this earth. Now, his philosophy, Chris, was really strange because it started out as kind of a polygamy flair that he uh, was um, ordained by God, the God he believed in, to have multiple wives. And uh, as his perversions intensified, and, and some say it was because he wasn't able to capably satisfy this harem of women that grew up to 30 or 40 women at the time he was arrested. Um, and, and he was one of several sister councils because there was about 120 members of this cult when we uh, broke the place up. But uh, as that intensified, he then came up with this idea that there were sister councils in heaven and that those councils were groups of women who also should get together and have sexual relationships with each other. And that that was all in the name of God. And of course, he, as the, as the guy in charge, could have sex with anyone he wanted. But as all perversions go, they intensified and became more disgusting and he then decided that the children should become involved. So as young as two years old, children were being sexualized and sexually abused on a daily basis in this group by this, this entire group. So that's what a sister council is, is uh, women who are assigned by God to work with one man, a form of polygamy, but a whacked out form, even, even more wacky than, the, <laughs> than polygamy is. And uh, that they then have these same-sex relationships uh, that are ordained of God in that group, but they continue to have sex with him. And then they, the women, have sex with the children, and the children have sex with Arvin, as that is what the definition is of a sister council. Yeah. And it, as hard as it is, Ron, Jackie, explain what the revelation came like to you when they start, when he taught that. And the amount of money this man of God spent on pornography. So it's gonna it'll be like in a nutshell. But how he explained when he started talking about the sister council and and his sister program is that they had a common thread. And this was the beginning of the reason why is because in the church in the Bible whatever there was a war in heaven, and a third of the host of heaven were cast out, followed Satan. Well, he says that that third was all men. So then the millions and millions of people that were left over were millions and millions of women. And in his, what he told us was there was no way that one man could suffice thousands of women in his sister program. So the sisters, like you said, got together, performed a council and presented it to him and said, well, what will we do to satisfy our own, our own desires? And they decided that women would enjoy each other's company themselves because Arvin couldn't do it all by himself. So that's, that's how you got the sister program, but it was tied by a thread. And, yeah. and his thread was underwear, bikini underwear or whatever it was. And so if he would walk through the grocery or a shopping place and see someone fondling women's wear, he would think that eventually that person would be in his 
sister council. And so how he did this was the final straw was as he came to our house, thought we were prepared to understand all. He brought in us four or five huge volumes. Started out with the Spiegel catalog, the J.C. Penney catalog, just cut out pictures of women wearing underwear. And it progressed to the final one where it was hardcore porn pictures, but it was always with underwear or some article therefore. And he told us at that time that he would go to Salt Lake and that he would go to a adult bookstore and he would buy several books just to tear out one picture to put into his portfolio. And at the time that he talked to us, he said he had spent nearly $40,000 in, into his portfolio. And so here's Jackie and I sitting on the couch as he's presenting this to us, tell, telling that we needed to find our thread, that there were sisters here already waiting to come into our council and, and that we needed to find that thread that was going to be able to tie all these women with the women because quite frankly, when they all passed away, these women would be roaming around, not knowing what's going on, not knowing who their male was, but they would tie each other in by that thread and they would walk around in the next world and say, oh look, there's a girl that likes underwear. She's now part of our program. And as deviant as that sounds now, after being indoctrinated for that long, but soon as he brought that to us, it was like, just like that, we thought, you've got to be kidding me. You've got to be kidding me. So we talked, we decided we're moving, we're getting out. I went and told Arvin that we were getting ready to leave. It's funny because I had four or five of the women that were friends with Jackie come to my work and try to convince me to let Jackie leave with the boys and for me to stay. And that fleeting moment was like, well, okay, <laughs> you know, but yeah, the carnal, the carnalness of me was like, yeah, great. But it was just that quick. And so then when we decided that we were going to leave, his only thing was, is just let us go in peace. But we had no idea what his whole thought process. We knew at the time that he had brought in another, another woman. We knew at the time that there were other women. And then when we were finally getting ready to leave, we found that out that one of his daughters had suggested, had said that he was part, she was part of his sister program. And that meant that the daughter and the girlfriend as well. So when it came down to it, we knew that he was, when we left, we finally found that he was having relationships at that time with him and his wife and his, another lady and his and his daughter and girlfriend. But we had gone by then and we just found those things out. And I think that's when, Mike, you got involved. Yeah, yeah this is really significant, Ron, because, uh, and, and to draw Latina, thank you so much for that she kind of right. donation. Uh, and, and yes, it is, uh, you know, we used to say in law enforcement, Ron, all the time, sex, money, or drugs. That's that's all you need in order to yeah. turn somebody. Correct. And, uh, and it just seems to repeat itself over and over again. But there was a really intriguing thing that this self-proclaimed prophet tried with you, Jackie, that backfired at the end when he tried to convince you about your mother. Do you want to share that? Oh, yeah. He said that when we were getting ready to leave, he he said that, are you sure you want to do this? He said he'd gotten revelation from my mother, from a lady with dark hair and she just passed away and she looks just like you. And I said, that's my mom. He said, I know. And she, she, this is the right thing. And you know, you should need to stay here. And I thought, no, you don't throw my mom in the middle of this because I know this is not right. I know. And that when he did that, that just sealed it all. That was a cement on top of that. We were done. Well, he, he claimed totally that when done. he was, when he was finally showing us all those books and all those, his, his whole library in a sense, not, or a portion of it, that's when he said that he could feel your mother there uh -huh. watching over us saying, yes, go for it. And it was heartbreaking because, you know, we, we were turning our back on this and yeah. And I thought, but no, he used your, you for that. Yeah. yeah and, you know, unfortunately we were smart enough to discern good from evil. You know, that was, that was a blessing that we, could do that because I hate to think what we would be in right now. 
Yeah, it would be a no. oh my gosh, Never that just makes happened. me sick. Just makes me sick. Yeah. You know, I want to I want to share a comment made by the late Dr. Margaret Thaler Singer. She said, "We know that people can be led to buy almost anything. In addition to buying almost anything, people can apparently be led to believe almost anything. Cults know that if you knew from the get-go what you were in for and what you would never uh, and why you would never join, it is as simple as that." Any thoughts? Amen. Amen. Well, and that's exactly the truth. If he'd have came in day one and said, hey, I've got a sister program set up. I'm going to have sex with all these women, including possibly children. And I want you to be part of that program. And I want you to go bring in other women. And I want you to have sex with them and possibly children. We'd have been like, are you kidding me, right? But the way he started it and the way that it went, it almost makes us feel foolish, to be honest with you, to sit and talk to you about this because we're not stupid. I mean, you know, I mean, but when you sit and when you were pushed into that thing and, and really when we first began, it was just his son and his wife and two children and us living next door and enjoying a neighborhood and saying hi and getting help from friends and and it, we just thought that that's how neighborhoods were supposed to be and being young and stupid. But we never would have, if he had come right out and said that, we would have said, you are the sickest, most deviant man. And it's like, why isn't someone shot you down or, or lightning shot you down or anything like that? But <laughs> we, didn't have, we didn't have a clue. We just didn't have a clue until he thought we were there enough to tell us and when he told us, it was like, oh, stupid you, you should have had better inspiration to know that we weren't even close to what he thought we were at. And I don't know that we played the game, but it was almost like we'll, we'll continue to be friends as long as you keep building our house and giving us everything. And it sounds really greedy in a way, but it's, it's almost like we, we just wanted to be friends, but we, we didn't want to be involved with the thing. And we thought, well, how long can we play it? And then... And then all hell broke loose, really, was when he tried to come and tell us that we were ready for this. And then he even tried to say that I had my calling and election made sure. And, and when he said that, it was like, dude, there's no way that I can have that. It's, you know, that's set for profits. And, and that's like, we just said, we're out of here. We're out. And Well, and, you know, one of the neat, th one neat thing, and I wish I could get in contact with this girl, his, one, his youngest daughter... Uh, she was all this was being forced onto She's her 12. and she was 12 years old. She would babysit our two boys and she would come up to her house all the time, all the time. And when we moved um, and left, and by the way, they bought our house just to get us out of there. So we, it was like hush money, but it didn't work. Um, <laughs> she called us up and, you know, we had a good talk and stuff. She left the family, another another family adopted her, one of her church leaders, and she's moved to Colorado. And Mike, if you know anything about her, I would sure love to be able to talk with her again. She has not wanted to talk to, to anyone. I actually passed that on. She is doing incredibly well, has a beautiful little family, is healthy and happy. Oh, good. Uh, and, uh, and she knows that you've, you've asked. Uh, Knight Rider asks, how did you and other neighbors feel about him? Did anyone detect any danger? And, you know, this is probably a good point, Ron. So uh, I didn't realize Ron had and Jackie had lived out there when we served the search warrant and part of our concern was in this neighborhood, it had grown. And I want to just show you um, everyone what it had grown to. Uh, these uh, blue points indicate the houses that cult members had purchased. Now this home right here is the home that Jackie and Ron owned uh, at the time that they were living there. But uh and they had actually even purchased some homes up into here. So the group was growing uh, pretty big, but the idea was to eventually take over this entire section right here. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, the thing that's so interesting is that uh, when, when this finally happened and the raid happened, we knew that there were hidden caches of weapons 
And we looked for those and found those uh, semi-automatic rifles that were hidden in the floors and in the walls, secret compartments in the homes that were used to, to hide the children during the raid, uh, large bunkers in the backyards. Uh, the homes were, had windows that were uh, barred and fortified, and all of the homes were uh, interconnected with alarm systems. But it wasn't until we started visiting with Ron and Jackie that we also learned there were a lot of other things. And he said, if I'd only been smart enough to call him, we could have found a few other things. Ron, why don't you explain that? Well, it's, it's funny because when you were showing us the raid that happened years that long ago and and you'd opened up the closet and pushed open a door and one of the rifles was there. And, and I can still remember saying, yeah, and if you would have pushed this wall just a little bit, this would have opened up. And, and Arvin had secured a lot of silver and a lot of gold. And because it was believed that in the days of the end of the days, Armageddon, money, as far as paper money, would mean nothing. You only could live with coins and barter with coins, silver and gold. And so he had walls, certain sections just lined with, with silver. He'd go down to Salt Lake and buy silver. And at that time it was seven, eight dollars an ounce, twelve dollars an ounce, but it didn't matter. And they would line these little sections underneath the closets behind the ones where the guns were at, and that that would be their silver and their gold. And it was like if you'd have just pushed one more wall, you would have found all of this stuff. But <laughs> You know, they they we we received a little bit of threats after we left, but you know their whole purpose of buying guns and weapons and stuff was for their little cult. But when we left, there was only one. There was one, two, three. There was five homes, four homes in the neighborhood when we left. Ours, his son-in-laws, another family member, and another member that bought on the corner. So then, so when we left, it was the early early stages. So it was quite astonishing to see what they had done in the two years that when we left, what they had done after, you know, just two years later, they had accumulated all those homes, put bunkers in there. Like you said, um, we knew there was weapons. Um, we didn't realize how many. We didn't realize how many. We just knew it was from the son, from the one son's house. We went down in there, but it, the gold and the silver was, was pretty amazing that they had accumulated over time. And like you said, Rather than paying tithing to the church, he, he requested the tithe go to the group, to the family, to the cult, I guess. And that's where he got a lot of money. He also got a lot of money from, from the women that would leave, the women in, would leave and take their children. And then the husbands would fight for custody. And what they would do in court is they would sell their kids basically back to the husband saying, you want your four kids or you want your three kids? Give me 10,000 or 20,000 each kid. And so the husband would be, you bet, I'm taking them away. Here's 50 grand. Give me my kids and leave me alone. And that's a lot how, how they got money as well. In the just, early stages. In the early stages. Yeah, yeah. And actually that continued on, but it was only male children that they would allow to yeah. leave. Um, so out of this huge group, only about eight male members uh, that were in the group. Uh, he, he has one cult member said did not want boys because they represented some form of competition for him. Something really interesting happened uh, a few months ago, Ron and Jackie, when we spoke, I played a videotape of Arvin speaking and prophesying. You hadn't heard his voice for 35 years, but your reaction and Chris, their reaction was, I wish we had recorded, but why don't you share what that was like to hear his voice? Well, I'll let Jackie talk. For me, first of all, I get very emotional about it because it was amazing to hear his voice and to see now what I knew about the man. I mean, he's so evil and such a, such a perverted individual and to see him stand up in front of a group of men and law enforcement or whatever they were. And, and the way that he just talked just made my skin crawl. And, and, and if, if I could describe Satan, that was him to a T in person to a T so disguised. He's not a serpent. He doesn't come out as a snake. He doesn't come out all cloaked and scary because that would scare all of us away. He is a person that talks normal, and that was Arvin, a pure, 
form of Satan. And when I heard it, it was like, it just took me back 38 years and thought, oh my Lord, I'm so grateful that I had the knowledge that I did and got out that I did and that I had a wife that was strong enough that we conversed about it and talked about it because it, it was just evil. And it just, it just took me back so far. And it was like, I don't, that experience was horrible. Now I can see footages of him walking through court and it doesn't bother me. But the first time hearing him hear, talk hear his voice was horrible. I don't know how it, Jackie it, no, felt about it. It just opened a floodgate and I basically felt the same way. It was like, why? You know, I, it was, it was a horrible feeling that yeah. came through me. Yeah. It, it, yeah, I, I don't know that I'll ever forget um, that. And, uh, and I would have to agree with you. It was uh, like dealing with Lucifer. Uh, and this one uh, very proper person said, he is clearly a, a wolf in sheep's clothing. Yes. And he destroyed a lot of lies. Folks, in this book, we're going to bring it up. And it's a shameless plug, but um, ho hope that you'll consider buying my book, Deceived. Uh, you've got just an inkling of of the introduction of how people were recruited into this cult. But uh, this man, Arvind Shreve, was responsible for the sexual assault and rape of thousands of counts against children. And uh, he destroyed uh, a lot of lives all in the pursuit of, of his uh, own sexual gratification. The book, uh, Deceived, it's uh, pre-order right now. It's gone to the printer, and we should have it shipping by the end of December, first part of January, and really appreciate your support in doing that. Uh, Ron and Jackie, would you uh, take some questions from people? Or Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, first one is, did anyone mysteriously disappear during the time that you were members? And I might say, folks, there were children, there were a few children purportedly that were born because they did uh, their own um, in-home births. There were a few children that didn't make it through the birthing process. Uh, there were a number of children who disappeared at the time of the raid that I was unable to interview that were sexually assaulted. And I had evidence against uh, members of the group who um, multiple counts, but those people simply disappeared. Uh, and so I can say it from that, but from your perspective, you were there in the early stages. Were there any concerns of people disappearing or anything like that? No, not at all. No, not at all. It, it was almost, it was like a family feeling, a family unit there. Nobody, I, we ju we just knew that during the the divorce proceedings or court proceedings that couples would come, but that the children would leave back with the with husband, the dads, with the dads with or something dads. like that. So at that time, we never knew of of anyone mysteriously leaving. And and I, and I'll add one more thing if I can, Mike. And I know we'll answer some questions as well. But I think my biggest regret out of all of this is that there were those two small children that were next door to us that. I, I just, I cringe and cry every day when I think about what those kids went through. And man, I wish I would have known more or could have done more. Um, but in my heart and in my beliefs, I just don't believe that no matter what's happened to children, what at age they are, that that God will forsake them. And I simply, that's my testimony. And I know, I don't know if you want to hear that, but I have to let you know and those in your viewers to know that I truly believe that God saves his children and that no matter what happened to them, they will be in sal they will they will have their salvation and they will be in the hereafter. They will be with their heavenly father. Well, I we would certainly agree. Chris, any thoughts while we see if there are a few questions that folks have? Um, you know, the only thing that strikes me is is the you know the correlation overlay of you know some of the you know, sadistic problems that, you know, uh, with even Lori and Chad Daybell today. I mean, it's when you, when I'm listening to, and, and by the way, you know, God bless you both. I mean, this is, it's, it's heart wrenching. And, and then simultaneously it's, you know, uh, important that people see these, uh, warning signs and the red flags of, you know, um, what you guys went through and others. And I think Mike, your book is going to be 
I, I hope they make it a movie, to be honest right. with you, because I, I think it's needed, number one. But, but I can't help get my mind out of, as I'm listening to the story, I mean, where you talk about the sisterhood, uh, you know, and Chad, you know, I'm, in my mind, I'm correlating back to what he talks about in, you know, um, you know, before he got here and how he was married in multiple relationships with multiple women through the eternities. And then he gets life and he runs into Lori and he, the, one of the first thing he drops on her for a control mechanism is, you know, we, we've, we've already been married to different people before. And by the way, we were married before, uh, before we got here in the pre-existence. And all of these things that you're talking about, and eventually even he says, you know, he gets to a place where sex and deviant behavior, sexual drive uh, becomes, you know, the, the, the main motive. And here this guy, you know, he's got sexual fetishes that he's dropping on, you know, people. And there's ideas that they just, I can't help, but my mind is just seeing these correlations, just kind of connecting and, and saying to myself, you know, I, I gotta be honest with you, Ron, Jackie. I mean, I don't think had you had Mike and his, their group, I, I think, I think you could have, you could have been the early, you know, Chad and Lori Daybell. Yeah. Oh yeah, definitely. Right. Oh, you know, definitely. You know, do you guys feel that? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes. Uh, Nat, hearing Marvin's voice, that's what we think about when we go back, when we heard that, Mike, it was just sickening to us. Like, look at where our lives could have, would have been. That it just the floodgates opened. Well, and the similarities between Arvin and Daybill is so familiar to me. I mean, if I listen to some of the things that he talked about, very religious at, at, as an upbringing, went on a mission, very studious and all of a sudden all these little ideas started to creep into his head that were all for him and that's just arvin to a t and then it just deviates from there and they're they're charismatic to the point that i hate that word but that's their that's what they are they they attract a certain element of people because of the way they talk and how they influence and all they had to do was tell Lori, you know what you're you're a priestess in heaven and you're the one that's more important than me and and it just sets it off, and I don't, it's just crazy. Yeah, we could have. It's it, it's scary. Yeah, that's that's again one of those cult um, strategies is to give people a, a sense of importance. Yeah. The question is, uh, what happened to the boys that were born? Uh, again, those that came in from marriages that had fallen apart, and, and this was a focal point of, of Arvin's group, was to get women going through divorce that needed help financially. They would sell the boys back to the estranged husband in that relationship and use that money uh, for the cult. Uh, children, boys that were born into the group, there were only a few of those that remained uh, and uh, there are stories around those. Chris, we've got another question there. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, what do you guys, uh, what do you, let's see, question. What do you guys do for your own healing? What advice can you give to people to help them heal from this type of trauma? What What say you? So Margie, this, this is how I would say it is, you know, thank goodness that I have um, matured and grown and understand in my in my beliefs, the, the atonement of, of, of our heavenly father and Jesus Christ. And um, the healing is daily. I mean, it, you know, you, we go about and do our things, but even, even what we were involved in there, you know, the, the sadness that I feel for those individuals that were complete victims, it's a daily thing and, and it will continue to be a daily thing. But I believe in, I believe in our salvation and, and in the atonement. And I would have, my suggestion or my advice for those that are trying to heal through that is, you know, I guess there's a saying, I probably don't even remember how it is. If you're standing there having a tough time, then, then kneel instead. And, and that would be, we all believe that we have a savior. We all believe hopefully that there is a God, whether God you believe in is fine. But I just believe that if we kneel and, and ask for help, and I just believe that that's the healing power. And for these, for these poor victims, you know, that's, I wouldn't be able to even answer 
how they heal or what they'd be able to do to heal. I just believe that there is something better for them in the future, in the hereafter that I believe, and that I believe that if they look for those healing powers today, it will help them. It certainly helps us. It does. I mean, you know, I mean, it's we struggle every day with other things, and you know. And I want to, I want to clarify something really quick. There was a comment that just strolled by, that was a misperception. Uh, this this amazing couple did not witness or even know about any of the child sexual abuse that was going on. They were in the cult and recruited uh, before this thing masticized and became the cancer that it became under no circumstance. Do I want any of you believing that there was any knowledge of any kind of sexual abuse in the early days of this group that happened seven, eight years after they left the group. So please make sure that that's very clear in everyone's mind. When we, Um, when we left Mike, all that was there was, was, was his son and his wife and two children, Arvin and another adult two woman, women. two adult women. And that was it. We didn't have any, we, that was the furthest thought from our mind that even children would be involved. I, I feel horrible at this time in my life because knowing that those children were involved, but we had no clue at all. Because I mean, it was snowballing. never, it wasn't even progressed to that point at all. We just, yeah. we left, we left because we thought that Arvin's thoughts were deviant and not of our beliefs. And so we got out of there and that's, that's all there was to it. We just said, you know what, live your polygamous style. If that's what it was, live with your, with your wife and another woman. But for us, we're out of here. I mean, and that's all we thought it was at the time. We had no clue what it progressed to. Yeah. I mean, that, that, that kind of statement saying, you know, would be the equivalent to buying Chad's first book and reading it and knowing that yeah. he was going to yeah. kill all, kill all the people, yeah. you know, down, down the road. So good for you. Yeah. And uh, yeah, we, we know what the truth is. We've got co- uh, wishing spiritually. Uh, I've seen this type of things turn uh, people off towards God. What, what would you say to them? Answer. I, I get that question. It's, that? it's it, these kind of things turn people off towards God. What would you say to them? What advice would you give them? Turn them off towards not liking God. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Is that what you're meaning? That's uh, the I, question. I, yeah. Uh, to me, I would say you better start kneeling and praying to him some more because he's your saving grace. He is your yeah. saving grace. And I don't, you know, I don't know how it could turn. Well, I in, in my experience, and with, I'm sure with Mike's and even with yours, uh, you know, we, we see terrible things happen to children and, and to adults. And because that happens, they they turn away from God because they can't believe that God would allow something like that to have happened. And I don't really know, and Mike might have a better answer for that, but I don't know what I would tell someone who's turned away to God or said there couldn't be a God that, that would allow something like that to happen. I don't, I don't know how to answer that. My own personal testimony or belief is that there is one. He, he, he did, he does allow us to have freedom of choice He's allowed some persons to have choice that obviously affects others, but I don't. I don't know how you would say how you like. I don't know how you explain to a person, and if you've discussed that with some of the people, some of the victims, that says there can't be a God. I don't know how you explain that to them because I don't know. I just know how that how someone could believe that because. Every once in a while, you see such traumatic things in our work. Well, and how could God let that happen right. to those I, little we, children? We, things, we see things we, that we think to ourselves, why would God let this happen? How, you know, is there a just God that would, and for thank goodness for my beliefs and strengths, but Mike, I don't know how you would answer that to somebody because I don't know. Yeah, I think this is a, a close out the night, actually. And, and to Coda Frank, thank you for that. Um, she, uh, Coda commented and complimented you both on your bravery well, you. uh, for sharing your story. So thank you. And thank you for that donation, Coda. Um, I think it has been a plague of history that people have wondered how bad things can happen to good people. They do um, all ancient scripture and document, whether you're Muslim, whether you're Jewish, whether you're Christian, whether you're Buddhist, uh, all have have experienced where good people 
have had to face horrible things in their lives. And it becomes an individual choice for each of us to decide whether we're going to cast our eyes heavenward and be grateful uh, and, and grow and become closer, or we're going to look downward and be victimized by it and forever choose the pain associated with it. But uh, to Ron and Jackie, thank you so much for giving your time up tonight to talk about this most important question about how do cults pull in seemingly great people. And I go back to the final comment by uh, Dr. Singer again. Cults know that if we knew from the get-go what we were in for and why, we would never join. It's like boiling that lobster do it slowly and he's going to stay in there and warm up slowly mm -hmm. and before long he's cooked from me and chris and and the profiling evil back office we say thank you so much and have a great evening everyone thank you thank, thank you very you. much have a good night thank you